Happy Independence Day. Happy Fourth of July. In light of the Fourth of July and our celebration tomorrow, I would ask you to indulge me this morning and join with me in standing and saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you stand? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. I don't know about you, but I think uh, we could use a little more one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. I'm not so sure that that's not more of a prayer today than a pledge. But happy Independence Day. Independence, freedom, liberty. This is, these are things that are truly worth celebrating. Cry of our heart is for freedom, to live free. And it's worth celebrating that freedom because as we reflect on what that freedom is, it's a, it's a freedom to, freedom to be who we are destined to be, a freedom to pursue our dreams, a freedom of, a freedom of thought, a freedom of speech, a freedom of ideas, a freedom for greatness, a freedom for opportunity. And all of these things are worth celebrating. But today, I want to focus on one aspect of freedom. It's not just a freedom to or a freedom of or a freedom for. I want to focus on a freedom from. And today, I want to focus on one dimension of what it means to be free from. I want to focus on what it means to be free from sin. Oh, boy. That's a trigger word, isn't it? Right there. There's some of you going, oh, I knew it. I knew this church was hiding it, but it's coming out now. Dave's going to weaponize the message, and he's just going to beat us up with guilt and shame, and we're just going to talk about sin. I knew it was coming, you sneaky riverbenders. You just walk around saying, oh, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're cool, we're chill, we're tolerant, we're accepting people, we're people of grace. But there it is, there's that sin. I knew you'd get around to it eventually. Now, I know there's some of you here that are going, it's about time. It's about time we got busy and we started calling sin a sin. We're going to have revival here, here at Riverbend Church, because Dave's finally going to talk about sin. We're going to get down to it. But you see, that's exactly the problem. For some of us, sin is a thing that, that we're familiar with, but, it, but it's, it doesn't wear us out. There are some things that, that we're okay with that other people would say, well, that's a sin. And then there's some of us who get all worked up and, and, and we think all of these things are sin and, and we're like, I don't, I don't know, we, we disagree. I want to take a survey this morning. I want to see what you, how you feel about sin. And, 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 I, and I'm, I'm hoping this is a safe place. And you can raise your hand and you, you, can, you can show everybody how you feel about sin, okay? So we're going to turn on the lights. Now, now I'm going to show you some pictures. And I want you to raise your hand if you think that, that what, what is on that picture is sinful. If you don't think it's sinful, you just sit there with your hands in your lap. But if you think it's sinful, just go ahead. Just, just say, that, yep, that's, that's sin right there. So you ready? You're going to raise your hand if you think it's sinful. Here's, here's the first picture. It's a picture of French's mustard ice cream. How many of you think that's sinful? What, 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 those of you who don't think it's sinful, you're going to eat that with whipped cream? Are you serious? Mustard belongs on a hot dog, not in an ice cream cone. That's just, boy, that's just, that's just wrong, okay? Since you know where I stand, that's, ooh, that, that's, ugh. All right, here's, here's the next one. If you think it's sinful, raise your hand. It's called a Ford Pinto. <laughs> You're a car guy, that's sin right there. See, the Ford people decided to make an economy car, but just chopping the butt end off a car. What they forgot to realize was if it got hit from behind, it blew up. 
So uh, you may not be familiar with the Pinto, but believe me, that is one ugly car. That's automotive sin right there. All right. I think you're all going to agree with this one. 9-11. Sin? 100%. I think that we all understood the evil of that day. But we might disagree about this one. Flavors of Pringles. You realize they got some strange flavors of Pringles. This one over here is soft shell crab flavored. This one over here is prawn cocktail. They have seaweed flavored Pringles. How many of you think that's sin? I'm not coming over to your house if you think, eh. here Dave, here's an appetizer. We got some seaweed Pringles. All right. I guess we're divided on the Pringles. Well, this one, let's see if we can come together on this one. Face tattoos. Now, I know that you can say, well, Dave, that's just a, that's a matter of choice. It's a free choice. You want to do that? You're probably disqualified from ever working in a preschool, but other than that, <laughs> you know, you just go for it. You're not hurting anybody. You want to do that to your face? I just, I just would probably think you'll regret that in about 40 years. Do you think that's sin? All right. You may disagree. You may, you may be more open-minded. But this last one, I'm sure, this is what sin looks like. <laughs> Broccoli, the most evil vegetable on earth. Nobody eats it without, like, tons of butter or cheese sauce or hollandaise or something on that bad boy. That, that is right there is what vegetables grow up when they're devil vegetables. You see, we have different opinions about what, what sin is. For example, there's a story. There's a story about a young preacher, and he was given a talking parrot as a present. And, and the person that gave him the parrot said, this, this parrot is amazing. This parrot has the vocabulary of a five-year-old. You can have an actual conversation with this bird. And I want to make sure that you have it. And this young preacher took the bird home and put it in his living room in a cage. And the first time a guest came over, the parrot didn't say hello to the guest. The parrot said, who the hell are you? And the young preacher is like, well, that's kind of funny. But his wife did not think that was funny at all. She said, well, this will not do. And so he, he, she said, what do you want me to do? We just got this parrot, and, and, and it talks all the time. And, and I didn't know it could cuss like that. She said, well, we can't have this parrot out here. We can't be around when people come over. So they put the parrot in the guest room, and the parrot didn't like that at all. And the parrot started cussing like a sailor in a brothel. I mean, it was just son of a that and, 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 and F this and B that and, and all. I mean, it was just, it was like going crazy. Now, frankly, the young pastor thought, this is pretty hilarious. <laughs> I'm a pastor with a cussing parrot. That's pretty funny. His wife did not think it was funny at all. But they didn't want to kill the parrot and they didn't want to give it to somebody. I mean, because... This, so they were in a dilemma. And finally, after the parrot would not shut up, and it was just expletive after expletive, the pastor grabbed the parrot, and he took it in the kitchen, and he stuck it in the freezer and closed the door. Well, he heard from behind the door just this thesaurus of expletives just over and over for like two or three minutes. His parrot was just cussing up a storm. And then it was silent. There was nothing. So the, the pastor thought, oh, man, I killed the bird. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to kill him. I just wanted to get his attention. And he opens the door, and the parrot jumps out and lands right on his, right on his arm and, and with clarity of voice says, I am so sorry. I will do my best not, not to say those kinds of things ever again. Can you forgive me? And the young pastor looks at him and says, Yes, I forgive you. And then the bird looked at him and said, one more question. The pastor said, yeah. He said, what the hell did that chicken say? <laughs> now I realize that some of you are saying, 
That was sin right there, that whole joke. You just took five minutes out of my life that I can't get back to tell me that silly story. That is the definition of sin, and that's the problem. If we're going to talk about being free from sin, we have to figure out what sin is if we're going to get free from it. Two weeks ago, we started a study, and it's more of a search than a study. We, we started a search for our soul. What is the science of our soul? And I propose that we as human beings have a, have a unique role in the universe, as far as we know. And, and we, are, we are both material and immaterial beings. We are made of what is known and infinitely of what is unknown. There's a part of us that is, that is more than meets the eye. And this is, this is in line with, with post-enlightenment human anthropology. Most scientists, most people who study human beings agree that we are, we are more than meets the eye. That we are not just a physical body, we are also conscious beings. We have thoughts and we have ideas and we are also emotional beings. We have a psychological makeup, and, and our immaterial part, the immaterial part of us, is as significant, if not more significant, than our physical part. This is completely in line with the portrait that the Bible has of us as human beings. Because the Bible, the Bible encourages us to see ourselves as fashioned in the image of God. And if God is a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are similar in our construction. We have a physical part, a body, and a will, but we also have a heart and an emotional part. And we also have a conscious part, our soul. But what is our soul? What makes up a soul? Well, we went into the laboratory and we looked through the lens of the 19th Psalm in search of the nature of our souls. Not only what is it, but how do we restore it? How do we renew it? How do we set it free? And what we discovered as we looked at the, at the molecular structure of the 19th Psalm was that there is some evidence there of what the distinctive of our soul is. And I suggested that the 19th Psalm suggests that we, we, we see evidence of our soul in our appreciation of, our acceptance of, our awareness of, beauty, that we as human beings have the capacity to admire and to meditate on and to recognize beautiful things, things that just are. They're just beautiful. And not only do we have the ability to recognize these things, we have the capacity to create beauty. It is the first indication that we are more than material beings, that we have a soul. The second thing we saw as we looked through the lens of the 19th Psalm was the evidence of a morality that we as human beings have, are fashioned for a purpose, for a design. Think of morality as an operating system. We all have operating systems. And each of us may be programmed just a little bit differently, but when we operate in line with our purpose, when we operate in line with true north, when we operate within the, within the framework of our operating system, we don't crash. We have an infinite capacity. And, and, that, and we have the need for that guidance, for that system, for that morality to tell us not just what is right and wrong, but to tell us what our purpose and our mission and our meaning in life is. And we have, as, as part of that immaterial part of us, a desire to know, why am I here? What am I here to do? Do I matter? Do I make a difference? This is evidence of our soul. But today we come to the third and the final piece of evidence from the 19th Psalm. And it is the evidence of the existence of forgiveness. If the cry of our heart is to be set free, Forgiveness is the sign of a soul set free. To accept and to be able to grant forgiveness is a work of our souls. But to understand that, to understand that, to see what that is, we, we have to go into the dark. We have to go into the sin. To study the stars, we have to go into the dark of space. 
because it's only in the dark of space that we see the true light of forgiveness. Before we enter into that, I'd like to pray. Now, I know a lot of you bow your heads at this moment, and I want you to look at me for a moment. You see what I'm doing? My first Sunday here at Riverbend Church, I wasn't sure whether or not I should take a knee as part of my message. See, when I came to Riverbend, I had been preaching for almost 20 years, and it was part of my routine. It was part of my habit. In the churches that I served, I, I did this as a, as a moment to reflect, to, to, to gather our focus as an expression of humility, to say, I'm going to take a knee to surrender myself, to integrate myself with the Spirit of God. And if you've been around Riverbend any length of time, you know that since that first Sunday in February of 2005, every Sunday, other than Sundays when I determined not to do this, I take a knee as part of our experience together, as part of the message. But if you're really paying attention, you realize that every time I do that, I pray the same prayer. Some of you may have heard it hundreds of times. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. These are the words from the last verse of Psalm 19. David was praying for an integration of his soul with his heart and with his actions. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. You see, David was praying for forgiveness. Just like I pray to, to be free from any burdens that would hinder me from serving you, from teaching, from, from communicating God's word, I, I pray what David prayed. I pray for that cleansing, for that freedom, for that forgiveness. And David is praying for that because he rehearsed the nature of sin in verses 12 and 13. In verse 12, he says, who can discern their, their, their errors, their, their mistakes, those, those failures that they're unaware of? Forgive me for my hidden faults, he says. Keep your servant also from willful sins that they may not rule over me then I will be innocent and blameless of great transgression. The study of sin, in theological terms, is called homardiology. Homardiology is the theological $5 word for sin. It comes from the Greek word Amartya, which is the most common word in the New Testament for sin. It means to break the law or to trespass. It, it, ha it has an entire, an entire thesaurus of translation. But there's another word for sin in the Greek language in the New Testament, and it is anomia. Anomia. Anom is that right? Yeah. Anomia. A means not, and namas is the Greek word for law. It means to not follow the law. And both of these words appear in Romans chapter 4, verse 7. In the first six chapters of the book of Romans, it is Paul's homardiology. In Romans 1 to 6, all the way into chapter 7, actually, the Apostle Paul is exploring the darkness of sin. What is the nature of sin? And in Romans chapter 4, verse 7, he uses these two words. He said, blessed is the man whose transgressions, amartia, are forgiven, and whose sins, anomia, are covered. But the Apostle Paul is not just speculating about the nature of sin, he is reflecting the rabbinic understanding of two categories of sin. He's reflecting his rabbinic training. You see, he's quoting Psalm 32, almost word for word. It's a transliteration of Psalm 32, verse 1, where it says, blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven, 
whose sins are covered. And, and it's an it's a identification of the theological conviction of the rabbis, of the, of, the, of the culture that Paul was raised in, and that is that you can classify all sin in one of two categories. And it just so happens that David believed the same thing. Because it's in Psalm 19, verses 12 and 13, where David shows us the two categories of sin. The first category is in verse 12, and it is the category of sins of omission. He says it in verse 12. He says, he says who can discern their, their errors? And, and the word there is the word shagah. And shagah, shagah kind of means mistakes. These, these, are the, these are the sins that I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know was wrong. I didn't know I shouldn't have said that. I didn't know I shouldn't have gone, I should, have, should not have gone there. I, I was unaware. They're, they're when, you, when you fail to meet someone's expectations, when you offend someone just because you smell funny, these, these are the shagah. But then he says, forgive me, there in verse 12, forgive us for our hidden faults. And it is the word sahar. And sahar means to hide with an intent to deceive. Those are our secret sins. The sins that nobody knows about. The things that we do in the dark when no one can see us. And so the first category of sin that the rabbis understood, that David understood, that if we were going to understand what it means to truly be free, to be free of sin, we have to understand that there is a kind of failure, there is a kind of sin that we do without knowing it. They say, oh man, that sucks. I mean, <laughs> come on, how, how, how are we supposed to keep up with that? Believe me, I, I'm well aware of this. I offend people all the time. I am, I am convinced I'm offending some of you today by wearing jeans and an untucked shirt. I'm offending some of you by using the word hell in a joke that I told earlier in the message. And I realize that I may have offended some of you by asking you to stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I do it all the time. We, do, we, we disappoint people. We fail to meet their expectations. These are sins of omission, not just the things that we hide from others. Those things that we do that we're completely unaware. I didn't know. I didn't know that bothered you. I didn't do it intentionally. It was just being me. About five years ago, a guy showed up here at the office in the middle of the week. It was a guy I hadn't seen in 25 years. He said, uh, well, I was in Dallas. I was down from Dallas on business. I was here in Austin, and, and, and I said, I got to go by, and I got to see Dave. I hadn't seen him in 25 years. Now, he shows up, and, and he says, I, I want to come by and see you, and I wanted to apologize. And I was like, uh, for what? He said, well, you know, 25 years or so ago, um, my wife and I were going through a tough time, and, and you didn't show up. I thought we were friends. You didn't call, and you didn't ask. You just kind of didn't care. And I hated you for that. And I knew they had left the church, and, and you notice when you're friends with someone, and then they disappear from your life. But I didn't, I didn't know I had done, for 25 years, he was angry at me. And he came into my office and said, I apologize, I need you to forgive me. And I'm like, oh, that's easy. You see, he was doing what, if you're familiar with the 12 steps in AA, it's, it's the eighth step. If you really want to get free, you've got to go back over your life and you've got to say, who are the people who I have wronged? Who are the people who I have harmed, even unintentionally? And if possible, I want to make it right. Well, that's, that's a heavy weight. <laughs> heavy weight. I mean, I could spend most of my weeks apologizing to most of the people that I know. Mostly my wife every day. I'm sorry. But the reality is, you see, we live in a world of entropy. 
We live in a world that doesn't get stronger. It's a world that continues to fall apart. We live in a world under the law of entropy, and the law of entropy says that once you stop growing up, you start growing old. It's, it's evident when, when, when you're finished building your house, the day you are done building it is the day that it starts to fall apart. It's entropy. We live in a universe that is, that is enslaved by the law of entropy, and it is forgiveness that sets us free. It is that forgiveness of, of keeping short accounts, of being willing to say, I, did, I didn't know. I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't know that bothered you. It's, it's being willing to make amends. It's being willing to hold ourselves accountable to say in so much as I possibly can, I will, I, will, I will seek not to offend or to harm. But you see, that's the beauty of forgiveness. The beauty of forgiveness is that it covers over even those things we are never aware of. I could have lived my entire life and never known I had offended that guy. I had no idea he was mad at me for almost 25 years. But the reality is forgiveness is great enough the grace of God is, 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 is large enough to forgive us even from our sins of omission. But there's a second category of sin, and I think you all know what it is. It's sins of commission. And I think there's too many letters in that word, but you'll figure it out. The sins of commission. The sins of omission. I'm so glad that there's spell checking now, you know, do you ever go back and look at your text and you say, oh, that's not what I meant. It's like when I think, I'm, I'm feeling like you're nuts. And I do Y-O-U-R instead of Y-O apostrophe R-E. Think about it. Um, <laughs> but the, the reality is, these sins I understand. These are the sins that I do intentionally. This is the times when I know where the line is and I cross it anyway. In verse 13 of, of Psalm 19, David says, keep your servant also from willful sins. And the word for willful sins that I'm trying to remember right now, show it to me. Show me, oh, oh, there it is. It's odd. That's it. I'm really having problems remembering my Greek and Hebrew today. The word zod, it means to be insolent means to know what to do and to do the opposite. It, it, means, it means to be malicious. It has the idea of intentionally offending someone. Keep me from intentionally offending someone that they might not rule over me, that those intentional choices may not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and innocent of great, and the word is pesha, peshe, peshe. Pache is, is this idea of, of trespass, of the idea of crossing a line, the idea, the idea of an awareness of disobedience. It's interesting, there's a bar downtown called Pache, and I don't think it's an accident that it's the same as the Hebrew word Pasha or Pache, which means to disobey. Now these I understand. I understand these kinds of sins. I understand these kinds of sins because they're represented by this one phrase. You're not the boss of me. And, and basically what we are saying to whatever rule we are violating or whatever line we are crossing or whatever offense we are intentionally doing, we're saying, I am, I am, a, I am a free, autonomous person. I will do what I want. I will say what I want. I will go where I want. I will cross any line. But what does he say? Notice what he says in verse 13. He says, keep your servant also from willful sins, that they may not rule over me. You know what these kind of sins are? These are the kinds of sins we cannot not do. I didn't want to, I didn't want to overeat. I didn't want to drink too much. I didn't want to take those drugs. I didn't want to lie, but I did anyway. And when I was doing it, I knew I was doing wrong, but I couldn't stop myself. 
But what does he say? He says, keep your servant. He's crying out to God for accountability. And I think sometimes to find true forgiveness, we have to find someone who will hold us accountable. Someone who will, who will say, because we can't do it on our own. Because sin is that strong. And, and, and it says that they will not rule over me. David, David recognizes the power of his vulnerability and his frailty. But, you, but it's, not, it's not just in the struggle with sin that we realize its power. It's the difficulty of forgiveness for sins of commission. It's the person who intentionally destroys your marriage. It's the person who intentionally destroys your company. It's the person who harms your child. It's the person who steals from you or lies to you. The person who crosses a boundary and intentionally harms you or offends you. Can you forgive that person? Oh, that's when it really gets to be tough. But I think the toughest part is, can you forgive yourself? Because we know the people we want to be, and we know the times when we don't live up to that, times when we give up or we, or we, or we, or we suffer under the slavery of, of our addictions and our, and, our, and our struggles and our temptations and our frailties. But I'm here to tell you, that the cry of our hearts is for freedom. And the promise of our soul is that we can be set free. That God's forgiveness is great enough to forgive us of our sins of commission and our sins of omission. So no matter how big we define sin, no matter how dark we believe that it is, remember this, the forgiveness of God is greater. So we get a sense of, of what sin is, of, of the depth of sin. But that's why I pray. That's why I take a knee every Sunday. And I pray what David prayed in Psalm 19. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, the things that I say and the things that I think, the things that you hear <coughs> and the motives that you don't, May they be pleasing in your sight. It's a prayer for forgiveness. It's a prayer for integration. It's a prayer for authenticity. It's a prayer that I pray every day. May I apply and may I express your forgiveness, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. You see, I believe that we are, we are immaterial beings we are people who are made up of, of not just our physical bodies. We, we have a spirit and a soul. And the cry of our spirit is to be set free. And the evidence of our soul and a soul set free is the power of forgiveness. How do we know that, that our souls exist? What is the science of our soul? It is that we can understand and appreciate and create beauty. It is that we have a necessary morality, a necessary operating system that guides us and directs us and gives us purpose and meaning and direction in our lives. And it is because we have the capacity to not only appreciate the power of forgiveness, but to actually grant it to others. This is the evidence of our soul. This is the story of the 19th Psalm. So what is sin, actually? What is it? Is it just two categories? Well, it's, it's hard to say. Sometimes sin is like a bad joke, like this. Let me ask you, why don't pickles ask for forgiveness? Because it's no big deal. <laughs> I know, that's terrible. That is, that is sinful, Dave. Why? why? But you're going to tell that to somebody. You're going to repeat that. 
and you're going to put that on somebody else. It's like, it's like a virus that I just unleashed on you, a bad joke virus. But what does sin look like? I mean, for example, what is this? Is this sin? You say, well, you know, I'm not sure that would be something I'd do. But hey, you know, if, if that's your jam, if that's what you're into, okay. I, I, I'm not, it wouldn't be me, but yes or no? I think we would agree for sure that this is sinful. Pictures of children from Auschwitz. I think we would all say, yeah, that's a picture of sin. We may be divided on this next one, though. A very large man in a very small Speedo <laughs> dancing beside a pool. You may say, well, go for it, brother. Feel free. And others of you may say, I can't unsee that, Dave. I can't. I can't. It's burned in my retinas. Well, well what about this? Unicorn meat. You're going, is there such a thing? Is that an actual thing? Well, if there is, I'm not sure we should eat it. We should put it in a zoo or something. We shouldn't put it in a can. That, that, can't, be, that can't be good. That's got to be sin. Unicorn meat, right? For sure. But I know, I know we will agree, 100% of us, on this is sin. Ketchup on hot dogs. Uh-uh. No, no, no. Mustard on hot dogs. Ketchup on hamburgers. Mustard hot dogs, good. Ketchup on hot dogs, sin. I'm not even going to go into mayonnaise on french fries. Don't do that around me. Just don't, don't do it. But you see, we, I think we, we acknowledge the reality of the idea of missing the mark, of falling short. But what we celebrate is the idea of forgiveness. And forgiveness has its evidence in our soul. Forgiveness is the evidence of a soul set free. And it is the cry of our hearts to be free. We are made in the image of God. And as people who have the Imago Dei, we are people who have a free will. We have the ability to choose. We have the ability to chart our own course we are granted by God great freedom. And we are given the promise that that cry of our hearts will be met through the grace and the forgiveness of God if we accept it and express it in our soul. Her name was Emma Lazarus. And she was a Jewish American poet. And when uh, the French government donated to the United States the Statue of Liberty, they took Emma Lazarus's poem called The New Colossus, and they carved it in stone on the foundation of the Statue of Liberty. You know what it says. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. Freedom is something worth celebrating. Liberty, independence. This is a weekend when we can rejoice in the freedoms that we have. But I would suggest that on the 4th of July and on the 5th of July and the 6th of July and every day, we celebrate our freedom, our independence, and our liberty. Our hearts cry for freedom, and forgiveness is a soul set free. Happy Independence Day.